Well, good morning. It's, uh, I consider it an honor and a privilege to be with you all this morning. Uh, yeah, as, uh, as Josh said, uh, I am uh, away from my, my wife and kids this morning, and she is definitely probably uh, executing the more difficult job this morning. My sons are two and one, so uh, <clears throat> she's got her hands full this morning. Um, well, if you've got your Bibles... If you will turn to the book of Ephesians in chapter 4, I am the the student minister at uh, First Baptist Church of Fairdale, and we have been traveling through Ephesians over the course of the last uh, month or so, and uh, it has been super good and and edifying for us. Paul has a lot to say um, in the book of Ephesians, and it is especially helpful, and I have found it especially helpful and Uh, for our younger kids who are learning what it looks like to live as a believer, right? Paul has a lot to say here in the book of of Ephesians, especially about that. Um, And and it shouldn't surprise us of that, right? If you've read in the book of Acts, uh, Paul visits Ephesus in Acts chapter 18 and then kind of all the way through chapter 20. and, And we see a lot going on there. He's there for about two years, And then the book of Ephesians is him writing back to them. And as he's writing back to them, there are two things that are really seeming to plague and are going on with the Ephesian church. The first is that there is spiritual darkness. Um, Many of you may not be big uh, church history buffs or anything like that, but uh, Ephesus was kind of the epicenter for idolatry and worship of a plethora of of gods. Um, It was home to the temple of Artemis, and so there was a ton of what we would consider to be pagan worship going on. Matter of fact, it was such a big deal that their economy was somewhat based on it. When Paul comes in and is proclaiming the gospel, it's having an effect. God is working, and it starts to have an economic impact because people stop paying the money that they used in in idol worship. <clears throat> and so uh, there's, a, there's a real deep spiritual darkness that the Ephesian church is up against. So there's one thing that he's talking about. And the second is there's some disunity. In the early church, there are believers that are coming from some seriously different cultural backgrounds, specifically Jew and Gentile, right? There's a, there's a whole lot of distinction and difference in their cultural backgrounds, and yet they're a church. They're learning what it looks like to come together and to follow Jesus together. And so Paul is writing back to them for a couple of things. One, encouraging them to continue to fight against spiritual darkness, and then also two, to be unified, to be a single church, to remember what has brought them together, and that, has, and that is that Jesus has died for their sins. They now live unto God And that is superseding anything that could potentially be different or divide them. And so Paul kind of travels through Ephesians talking a lot about this, their oneness in Christ, how they've been saved. You get a lot of that in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, you get into uh, Paul talking about the fact that the gospel has even been made its way to the Gentiles, which is probably the vast majority of us in the room. And so... He talks and prays for spiritual strength. He talks about unity in the body of Christ and how that is such a big deal. And then he gets to our little section here in verses 17 and 32, through 32. And he, many of your Bibles probably have it titled The New Life or something like that. And Paul is now transitioning to how ought they to live, this Ephesian church. And you're getting a little bit of reminding them of where they were and what they should look like now, especially amongst a city that is so spiritually darkened and as a unit, a body of believers who could so easily be divided by, by their cultural backgrounds. How do they live now? So if you've got your Bibles to verse 17, that's a little bit of a background for where we are. Follow along with me all the way through verse 32, and then we will study this text together. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. 
They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the, their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. <clears throat> All right, so we've got a, a, a fair amount of stuff going on there, uh, but we're going to divide this into three different sections, and I hope that that's helpful for our understanding of what Paul is trying to communicate here to the Ephesian church. And the first we see is in these first three verses of verse 17, 18, and 19. And Paul is somewhat describing their old life. And when we talk about the old life, we're talking about they have not heard the gospel of Jesus. They do not believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So what is life like? And I hope what you notice in verse 17 through 19 is for the unbeliever, there is nothing but sin and the depth of sin. Paul really describes the depth of of sin and the seriousness of it really well here in verse 17 and 19. And there's a couple things I want to show you. The first is that when we're talking about not believing, we're talking about darkened in our understanding. Darkened in our understanding. And Paul says this kind of phrase often when he talks about those who do not believe. But specifically, we get it in Romans 1 verse 28 when he's talking about, again, people who do not believe. He says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done, right? They are darkened in their understanding. <clears throat> they don't know God, therefore they don't understand him, and they are darkened in the way that they view life. Life is not about God to those who have not heard the name of Jesus. It, it starts to be about anything else. And really, most of the time, what that ends up is it ends up being about the self, right? They are darkened in their understanding. The second thing is that they don't respond to God because they are hardened in heart. Now, that's a phrase that gets used a lot in the Bible. And I hope that when you hear that phrase, hardened in, hardened in heart, there was a, a story in Exodus that came to your mind. Because this is not the first time that we've heard people who don't want to follow God, don't want to know him, don't want to be anything like him, the Bible describes that as a hardness of heart, right? And in, in an Exodus, we get Pharaoh who is continually confronted with the power of the God of the universe as he is experiencing plagues upon his nation for not letting the people of God go. And the Bible describes that multiple times when, when he is called to let the people go, it says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. And Pharaoh hardened his heart. And he wouldn't let them go, right? But that is what it looks like for someone, as were many of us, who do not know God, who do not want to follow him. Our hearts don't want to know God because they can't know God. And they can't know God because they don't want to. They are hardened of heart. Just like Pharaoh's was, even though he's confronted with the miraculous power of God for his own eyes, <clears throat> that doesn't matter to a hardened heart. You got to see how deep sin goes. We have to take it really seriously. And then, in conclusion, here in, in verse 19, Paul really gets to 
how deep sin can really, really go. It's not just about darkened in our understanding and being focused on the self. It's not just about being our hearts being hardened against a holy God. It actually goes even further than that. It can go even further than that. Look at verse 19. Due to their hardness of heart, right, they, they're alienated from God. They're separating from him. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear the word callous, but there's a specific thing that comes in my, in my brain. When I was in college, I used to, I, my last year of college, I was waiting tables. And that was a pretty good job. It was fine. I was doing it primarily because I was trying to get married at the end of the year, right after I graduated. So I was just working all the time while also taking classes. But I was waiting tables, and there was a guy in the kitchen that I, I got to make relationships with all kinds of people, but there was specifically a guy in the kitchen that I got to have a pretty good relationship with who was uh, cooking stuff all the time. And he had hands that looked so rough and rugged it, it blew my mind. And at one point in time, we used to have chips that we served with spinach artichoke dip at the place that I worked. Well, we baked those in the oven. And this guy's hands were so calloused, so rough, I could watch him open up the oven, fresh out of the oven, grab the tray with nothing on, and pull that tray right out of the oven and just set it down. And I would always be like, that is amazing. How do you do that? That's amazing. You know, because for my 22-year-old self, I'm thinking that's super manly that he can do that, that he can just pull that out of the oven with no problem. He doesn't need oven mitts or anything. His hands are so calloused, right? But here's the problem. <clears throat> that callous is actually, as cool as it is to watch him do that, that's actually a problem because when you become callous, whether it's your hands or whether, as Paul describes it for the unbelievers, it's their heart, the problem with a callous is you can no longer feel anything. It's actually important when you stick your hands in the oven that your hands are supposed to feel that. It's supposed to hurt because your hands are actually being physically burned when you pull that out of the oven. It's important for you to feel that. You need to know when your hands are burning. But Paul describes the depth of sin in this way. Because here's what you need to know. There is, either, there is either growing closer to God or there is growing further away from him. There is no in between. There is no remaining stagnant. And for those who do not believe or who have not heard, they only grow further in sin. And what they can do in the depth of that sin is grow to be so calloused that they don't feel bad about it or remorseful about it anymore. And Paul describes that in verse 19. They become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, and impurities of all kinds, right? They don't feel it anymore. This is the depth of sin that Paul describes here. And it should terrify us that we could be so alienated from God, be so committed to, the sin, to sin that we can grow callous to it and not feel it anymore not feel burdened or bad about it anymore. We're supposed to feel bad about sin. We need to. So first thing is Paul's describing that old life and he's describing just how bad that can get. But then he turns in verse 20. Look at this. But this is not the way that you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Paul's reminding them of just how bad that that can get. But then he quickly turns and reminds them, but don't forget that Jesus makes all the difference. This is not how you learn Jesus. You don't continue in that anymore. You heard us proclaim to you the truth about Jesus. That is, that he is God who came, born of a virgin, took on human flesh, lived without sin for you, and then when confronted with that, still went to the cross, died, was buried, and was raised from the dead so that you can be forgiven of what I've just described in verses 17 through 19. You can be forgiven of that. Jesus makes all the difference. That sin doesn't have to have hold on you anymore. <clears throat> but if you've heard about Jesus, you don't continue in that anymore. Rather, 
you do something different. Look in verse 22. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Right? That was the old life. That, that pursuing and going further and deeper into the depths of sin... That doesn't happen anymore because you heard about Jesus who can forgive you of that sin if you are believing and trusting in who he is and what he's done. And now you can turn from that and you can turn to God. You can make that hard turn and follow God. Repent of that sin and believe and trust. But that means leaving this and moving towards this, right? What we just said earlier, you can't, you can't remain stagnant. You're either growing further from God or alienating yourself from him or you're moving closer to him in Jesus. There is no remaining stagnant. So Paul calls them to this putting off of the old self and putting on of the new. Sorry, that was really loud. God changes us through the proclamation of Jesus. Our eyes are opened to who he is and what he's done. It are open to the depths of that sin that we've been living in. And then we repent of that and we believe and trust in Jesus, and through that we are forgiven. And Paul uses this old self, new self language a lot. We read it, we read it in Colossians this morning for our call to worship in uh, chapter 3, when he says uh, in verses 1 through 10, but we'll, we'll stick with just, just 3, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly. And he lists all of these sins, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Put off the old self with its practices. And then verse 10, and have Put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. That sounds like the opposite of a debased mind, right? That mind is now being renewed. He also does it again, and I promise we'll only do two more of these examples, but I find it really helpful for us to be reminded that Paul is like hammering this into our heads as we study his letters. But in Romans chapter 13... Listen to what he says in verse 12 and verse 14. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. That's, this, that's different language, but it's the same principle, right? We're putting off, we're repenting of sin and turning away from that, and we're putting on a new life that is in Christ. Verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires, right? And it's not just about behavior modification. Rather, it is being transformed by Jesus. That's why in Romans, I love that language, right? Put off the old self, and in verse 14, he says, put on Jesus. That righteousness that he earned for you when he died on the cross for your sins. You have to believe and trust in that. And then he says the same thing also in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Listen to verse uh, 27. For as many of you as were baptized in Christ, that is, they have chosen to believe and trust in Jesus, have put on Christ. There is now a new life. Jesus ultimately makes all the difference and it has enabled the ability to put off the old self and to put on the new. That kind of transformation only comes through the saving grace and power of Jesus Christ and believing and trusting in him and who he is and what he's done for the forgiveness of sin. That's the only way that transformation happens. And then we get to this last section, that's verse uh, 25 through uh, 32, kind of the end of that section. And we get, this, we get this section and reminder of here's some things that it looks like to live the new life. Here's some examples of what it looks like to live the new life. And we're going to get, a, and he goes on in this for some time through the rest of Ephesians as he talks about walking in love and what it looks like to now be a believer if you are a husband and a wife, if you are a parent and if you are a child, if you are a, a, a boss or a master or a servant or a worker, right? 
all these things that you start to get, Paul is explaining, hey, this is what life looks like for the believer now. If you've put off the old self and the new self, he's going to go through the rest of the book and say, this applies to every facet and role in your life. It will change everything. But here in this last section, he gives us some examples of living the new life, right? He says, put away falsehood. He says to not be angry. He says, no longer stealing. He says, no more corrupting talk, right? Not grieving the Holy Spirit. Those are all old self things. Those are depths of sin, choosing to not follow God, but rather turn away from him. That's, those are characteristics or character traits of the old life. But what we know is that when we talk about putting off the old self, it's not just about not doing the wrong things. It's now about turning loving God and doing the righteous and holy things. Not because it's going to improve our standing before God, but rather it's going to give evidence that God has changed us. God has worked in us. So it's putting away sin and it's now putting on holiness or putting on Jesus is the way Paul describes it in Romans. And this is super important. And why is that putting on of righteousness so important and I mentioned it very quickly in passing but it is because it is revealing of what God has done in the heart if you want to know am I now living as if Jesus has changed my life there are fruit that give evidence to that John talks about this a ton in his letters in first John and second John But Paul talks about it as well. And one that I want to draw your attention to that should be very helpful is when he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only as such as as good for building up as fits the occasions. Now, I only pick that one specifically, not because it's any more or less important than the other ones that he's... But when you hear that, well, why is it so important? Why would it reveal something about me, about what God has done in me, if I don't talk poorly anymore, if I don't talk uh, corruptly anymore? And I hope that you're reminded that there was in those gospels where Jesus says, out of the overflow of someone's heart, their mouth speaks. These things that, these things that Paul is mentioning, they're, he's not mentioning them because doing them is going to save you. Rather, he is mentioning them because they are revealing a heart that has been changed by the gospel of Jesus. If you know, is Jesus working in my heart? Has God changed me? You, there are things that happen. There is fruit to that life. And Paul is telling them, yeah, you got to put on the new life. This is what this looks like. And the reason I bring up the corrupting mouth is because Jesus told us the same thing. If you want to know what someone's heart is like, you can view their life and the way that they speak. If you want to know if you've been changed by the gospel of Jesus, pay very close attention to the way that you live and the way that you talk. Not because that that's going to save you, but because it will give evidence and it will show you that God has changed your heart and made it more like himself. Because God doesn't know any of this impurity. He is holy and righteous in everything that he does. <clears throat> So this is what the new life looks like. And we are called to this not just one time in hopes that this is going to continue on. Rather, this is a daily decision, right, to put off the old self and to put on the new self. The example I I give to my students is I don't just decide that I'm going to try to be patient with my two-year-old one time. If I do that, I'm going to turn out to be a really, really bad dad. But rather, because as many of you all in the room probably know, two-year-olds are really testing. Not, Not just because they're imperfect and sinful, but because that's a huge emotional stage that they have no idea what to do with any of that. And so there's this constant need for me to have to remind myself of, he is two years old. And I have to be patient with him. A, that's like an, a minute-by-minute minute reminder that I have to give myself, much less daily, right? But, this is a, but the, the new life, living in Jesus, reminding ourselves of who he is and what he's done, and then trying to live that way, that's a daily 
hourly, minute-by-minute decision that believers have to make, that we are going to choose to love God who has saved us instead of alienating ourselves from him. It's a daily thing. And here's what's important, and then we'll, we'll close with this, with this section right here. What I, want you to rem- what I want to remind you of is while we have a part to play, Right? These are, these are a daily, mentally decisions that we're making to love God and to follow him because of what he's done in us instead of following anything else. God has not left you to do that on your own. Sanctification involves both you and God. As you are doing this, as you are striving after him, be reminded that the scriptures remind you that God is worth working and changing your heart. He is renewing your mind as you do that. As you seek to follow him daily, minute by minute, situation by situation, choosing to try to do what is holy and righteous because of who he is and what he's done in your life, he is also renewing your mind and shaping your heart and conforming you more into the image of Jesus. You are not remaining the same as you walk that. He is working in you. And then as you look back and you're reminded, you're looking forward saying, man, I just, I'm not where I want to be. That's why the believers always say, yeah, I'm not what I want to be. And I look back, but man, I am not anything what, like I used to be because God has changed me. I can see that point where I turned from my sin and followed Jesus way off in the distance. And man, glorification is way down the road. But I'm so far away from when I was initially changed and I have followed and striven after God ever since because God has not left me on my own. He is changing my heart and changing my mind. And then Paul kind of gives you a vision of what that looks like here, right? In verse 32, after he's gone through this whole list of all the things that they need to be turning away from, these examples of turning away from sin and turning to God, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. And he gives you that little snippet at the end of, this is what the Ephesian church ought to look like. Being kind to one another, tenderhearted, loving one another, even though they're so different, even though they're, they're being confronted with spiritual darkness and atrocity, they're reminded of this is how they look. Why? Because Jesus has made all the difference. And they now strive after God. And that, may that be true for not just your church, but for my church and for the churches where we gather on Sunday mornings to worship the risen Jesus. May this be what we look like, regardless of the fact that we all come here every Sunday morning with hundreds, if not thousands, of things that could divide us and make us different. And we're confronted with, very obviously, plenty of things that go against what we believe beyond these walls. But don't, don't forget, God is working. And as we strive after him in the new life, he is changing our hearts and shaping our minds. <clears throat> Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, the word of God. Thank you for the book of Ephesians. And God, for those of us who, who remember what it was like when we first heard Jesus proclaim to us, God, we remember what it's like to be convicted of sin and then to say, I need to to do something different. I need someone to save me. And learning that it is Jesus who has died for our sin and by believing and trusting in that, we can be forgiven. We remember those moments and then we're called to a new life, a life that is spent following after God, repenting of our sin. And God, that is long and that is weary but God you are working in us and so as we are striving after you we know that you are changing and shaping us and may it be that every Sunday morning or Wednesday night or however often that we're gathering gathering as our churches may we be reminded that we're called to a newness of life you are working in that and it is all possible because of Jesus God, we love you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.
right, I want to invite you to stand again if you're able. We're going to sing of God's amazing grace that has removed the chains of our slavery to sin. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. We'll move straight from there into trust and obey. Let's sing together.